Hebrews chapter number 11. We'll begin in verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse number 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. I'd like to preach on those three characters, verses 4, 5, and 7 there, Abel, Enoch, and Noah. And my title is Seeing Faith. Faith seems to be something you can't see, but through the lives of these Bible characters, we can see faith. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother uh, Rick Hatcher, we ask the Lord to bless the message for us. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for this opportunity again to show up and hear your word preached. Thank you for the Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. So as we begin to think about faith, you obviously see a definition in verse number 1. Uh, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So that's a definition we can obviously go by. But you know, there are a lot of fallacies out there about faith. Uh, some people think faith is a blind leap. It's just you're jumping off into the dark, you know. Some people think faith, they have this perception that faith is a blank check. That you just believe it hard enough, ask it in Jesus' name, and then you'll get it. Some people think faith's a bad choice. They think it's foolish to talk like some of these testimonies this morning, to say, I have faith that it's going to be all right. Let me say this. i got to get this off my chest. I said this to the first crowd. Um, we've been praying for the Lord to come back for a long time. Amen? Amen. We pray just about every time we pray, we're like, Lord, even so come. You know, that's a good thing to pray for. I want the Lord to come back. He promised that he would. The last prayer in your Bible is not for world peace. It's not for anybody to be healed. It's not even for anybody to be saved. The last prayer in your Bible is even so come, Lord Jesus. That's a good prayer to pray. However, I've always kind of thought everything's just going to kind of cruise along like it is and we're healthy, wealthy, and wise and we've got our air conditioner and we've got our big Sunday lunch and everything is good and then the Lord comes back on Sunday night to see how many people are faithful, right? Um, no. We didn't know that some other things may happen although I have told you some things I believe from Bible prophecy from the book of Daniel and so forth. There's not a big super world power over here in Bible prophecy. I do not believe the United States economy will be the driving force in the economy when you get out into uh, the Bible speaks of the Great Tribulation period and those things like that. So I believe you've got to see a fall of this great empire. And so we very well may be seeing that. So we pray even so come Lord Jesus. Well, maybe some of these things we're seeing are just things that are going to happen before the rapture of the church. And thank God, by the way, we're going to be raptured before the Great Tribulation period. The Bible does teach that that will happen. The body of Christ goes before the Antichrist shows up on the scene. Although the technology may be here, the man of sin is not here yet. In other words, the Antichrist is not the son of perdition on the scene where all the world comes together and worships that one man. However, he will be, bring unity to a disheveled world. But thank God that we've been praying for the Lord to come back. 
what did we expect? <laughs> did we expect everything? By the way, I hope you realize this. You do not have free speech in America. Do, do you realize that? So I got free speech. I'm an American. <laughs> I believe in miracles and I'm an American. You don't have free speech. Just go ahead and take a deep breath and it's going to be okay. You don't. You can get on TV and cuss Jesus Christ all you want to and use profanity, but there are certain things if you say, they will lock you up. And different laws that have recently been, been passed are going to affect the church eventually. You mark my words. There are certain things in this Bible that some people can consider hate speech from the Bible. And so it's just a matter of time. So it's all right. The Lord, like one of the testimonies, the Lord knew this was coming before we knew it was coming. And it's going to be okay. We've been praying for the Lord to come back. We prayed for the bars to close for how long? <laughs> the bars closed, but the church is closed too. So, you know what I mean? It's just been difficult times. But this whole key to this thing, I believe, is faith. And as we look at these characters, we have to realize faith is not a bad choice at all. We are to live, Paul says, by faith, not by sight. Paul says, we look at things that are not seen, but the things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. I've never seen Jesus Christ. I've never seen New Jerusalem. I've never seen heaven. I've never seen God. But I believe by faith. Somebody defined faith by the acronym F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I trust Him. That's a good way to define faith. You'll notice in the verse it's substance and it's also evidence. Faith is not belief in spite of evidence. Like some people have us to believe it's some blind leap in the dark. Faith is not belief in spite of evidence. That would be superstition. There's a lot of superstition. Knock on wood. Some of you won't even walk under a ladder. Y'all need to come out of the dark ages. I shouldn't have said that. Why? If you say it, it's going to come true? Positive confessionalism? Come on now. Let's get out of the dark ages and realize faith is not superstition and God is not asking us to believe in something that's not true. We have faith in the facts. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the hinge pin of Christianity and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical event. I have faith in Jesus Christ who's not dead but alive. Right. So it's not belief in spite of evidence. Somebody said, when I expect God to do as He has promised, that is faith. When I expect to God to do as I wish, that's presumption. And we're not to be presumptuous. You see, a lot of people, because they don't rightly divide the word of truth, they stay in the Gospels and they think, well, Jesus and the disciples cast out devils and healed the lepers. So what did uh, what was that guy? Uh, Hagen, Car Hagen, the, the uh, faith healer guy. Is that his name? You know who I'm talking about. All right, Brother Dell says, yeah. I saw a YouTube clip and he actually got rid of the coronavirus. He rebuked it in the name of Jesus and said, be gone. This is back in April. But what happened to it? It didn't go. So, you know, evidently he had a foul ball or something, you know. But what people do is they take verses out of context, out of application for our age, like the gospel accounts. Jesus walks to, to a leper and touches him. I would not recommend for you to go up and touch a leprous person. You say, why? It's a highly contagious disease. You say, well, I can just claim it in Jesus' name. Okay, jump off the roof and ask God to float you. Okay, well, let's just use a biblical example. Get out of a boat at high seas when there's a storm and walk on water. Well, it's in the Bible. They raise people from the dead in the Bible too. It doesn't mean it's applicable for you now. Doesn't mean we don't have faith. Well, if we really had faith, we could move mountains and do what the apostles did. No, God was going to let you do what He's promised you to do. We are living in a time where Paul says we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Signs, wonders, and miracles were things that were given to convince people to believe you are to believe based on what God says. 
When you convince somebody Jesus Christ rose from the dead, you give them the Bible truth, which is the facts, and they have to put faith in the facts. You can't produce an image of Jesus Christ. You can't peel back the clouds and let them see into the third heaven and see Jesus. You can't walk on water or raise up somebody from the dead in order to convince them. They have to believe by faith. If there ever was a time for people to be people of faith, it's now. We're walking in the dark in the sense of we don't have signs, wonders, and miracles. We have to believe God by faith, and sometimes we don't understand. Oftentimes, we don't understand what's going on around us. We have to have faith that God is going to take care of things. Ravi Zacharias, he defined faith. I love this definition. Faith is a confidence in the person of Jesus Christ and in His power. So that even when his power does not serve my end, my confidence in him remains because of who he is. God is God. You know, these Islamic terrorists, they believe that Allah tells them to kill people. And they go and do Allah's killing for him. God doesn't have to tell anybody to kill for him. If God wants you dead, you're dead. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. God's in control. And you don't have to try to manipulate things around to try to see if God's in control. God's already in control. And you have to have faith and confidence in who He is, not just what He does. People are so shallow in their faith, if they don't get a prayer answer, they doubt God. You mean to tell me God has to be a bellboy and do exactly what you say before you're going to trust Him? He's already given you the Bible. He's already given you ample evidence and proof when He rose from the dead. The Bible says it was infallible proofs. We are to trust Him. Forsaking all, I trust Him. Now let's look at Abel here in verse number 4. The love of faith. Here we see Abel, and you know the story of Cain and Abel back in Genesis. We don't have to recount the actual story, but we know that when Abel did what he did, it was an act of worship. I think we could all admit to that. And this shows that Abel is loving God and doing what God wants him to do. And he does this by faith. I believe when Adam and Eve sinned, if you remember correctly, they had made fig leaves and that didn't work. In the Bible, fig leaves, because of that, because of Israel's stubbornness, fig trees and fig leaves rep rep represent pride and self-righteousness. And so they tried to cover up their sin by sewing their own garments together. And God said, that ain't going to work. So God took an animal, we don't know what it was, although I believe it was probably a lamb because of the typology in Scripture, and he skinned it. The first blood that was shed was an animal that died, and God had to kill it to clothe and cover Adam and Eve because of their sin. The principle of animal sacrifice was thus established. God could forgive and atone based on the death of another. And that was passed on from father to son. You see it through the age of the patriarchs. And I believe Cain and Abel were told that story. And I believe Adam had told Cain and Abel that that was the sacrifice God required for them to have fellowship with God. Abel brings the correct sacrifice and he does it by believing what his dad told him that God told him. Believing by faith. Abel brought the wrong sacrifice. He brought, he brought turnips. He tried to get blood out of a turnip. <laughs> You wonder where these expressions come from. That's one of those expressions. You can't get blood out of a turnip. And he brings the fruits and all his hard labor and all his work, and God did not respect Cain's offering. That's a great type picture of religion. Religion tries to do all these things to show that it's justified. In other words, religion tries to do all these things to save itself. People do sacraments, they take communion, they get baptized, they join a church, they try to do good deeds, they join charitable organizations, they contribute money, they try to do these things to buy their salvation. You can't buy a gift. Salvation's a gift. And salvation's based on a sacrifice, and a sacrifice, somebody's got to die. The turnip produced no blood. Abel brought the sacrifice, he brought the lambs, and of course God had respect to Abel and to his offering. He brought the correct sacrifice. You know, it doesn't matter how passionate you are about something. It doesn't matter how much you believe something. I know there are people that are genuine 
and they're sincere and they're passionate and they're, they're um, zealous of what they believe. You can find Hindus. There are, very, there are some religious Hindus that, are, that persecute Christians, actually, in India. There are some different groups. And they're very zealous and they think they're doing right. There are Muslims that think they're doing right, that are very passionate. There are Buddhists. There are uh, people uh, in, in different religions, Protestant religions, Roman Catholicism, Greek Orthodox. They think their religion is right and they're very passionate about it. You can be sincere and be wrong. You can be sincerely wrong. That's why truth is so important. Jesus Christ stood in front of Pilate and he said, everyone is of the truth, heareth my voice. And Pilate said, what is truth? And he walked off. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is so very important. If you repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it. We see that in our modern culture, propaganda. We must be correct in our worship. Abel brought the right sacrifice. You know, a lot of people believe in things, but you can be wrong in your belief. There was this lady, she'd get ready to have surgery, and she's all nervous and everything, and she's talking to the doctor. You know, how you get nervous, and then sometimes you begin to wonder about the credentials of the doctor. You think, man, I hope this guy just didn't wander in here one time. Back at a church we used to work at in Georgia, and we were youth, uh, worked with the youth up there, there was a guy in the neighborhood that where the church was, and he just wasn't all upstairs. And he'd come to church sometimes, and he'd be dressed as different people. I'll just leave it like that. I saw him walking down the road, and we were picking up kids for church one day, and I said, man, there's a doctor walking down the road. It was Corey. His name was Corey, by the way. <laughs> it was him. He had, and somehow he had gotten a hold of all these. I mean, he looked like he was about to have surgery. Had the thing around his head. Had to, he's walking around, got the scrubs on. Had the whole nine yards. Anyway, this lady, she was nervous about having surgery. She got to talking, you know, in pre-op to her doctor and everything. She goes, I'm kind of nervous. This is my first surgery. The doctor said, yeah, mine too. <laughs> Whoa, that's probably not the right thing to say, even if it is your first surgery, right? Um, but anyway, you can be sincere and sincerely wrong. You have to have the right sacrifice, and that's exactly what Abel does. Notice, you can be correct but also when you're correct, you oftentimes will have confrontation. We know what happens with Cain and Abel. Abel's sacrifice is accepted. You say, how do you know? Because in the Bible, there's a few cases when this happens. Fire comes down from heaven and consumes the sacrifice. Cain's sacrifice is sitting over there and nothing's happened to it. And then Abel's like, look, brother, if you want one of my lambs, I know you're not a shepherd, you don't have any lambs, I will give you one and then you can have the sacrifice. That sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus says, I'm the sacrifice, but there's only one catch. I have to give you myself as a free gift. You have to take it as a gift. There's nothing you can do. And Cain's like, I'm not going to have something I can't do myself. I'm too proud for that. And he got to talking more and more, and he got more and more jealous. And the Bible says he rose up against Cain, Abel, his brother, and slew him. The first man born on this earth was a murderer, Cain. That's a tragic commentary on the human race. Cain was religious, but he wasn't righteous. He worshipped, but he was wrong. Abel here by faith did what God told him to do. He did it the correct way. He had confrontation. By the way, if you're going to sacrifice for God, you're going to have some confrontation with that. There's a price that has to be paid with sacrifice. And it always happens. But then notice there's a cost. Obviously, that's pretty clear that animal had to die. Romans chapter 12, we all know the verses, but he says, I, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If we're going to worship God... We need to have the right kind of faith like Abel so we can bring the right kind of sacrifice. The life of love seen by Abel's worship. But notice in verses 5 and 6, the life of faith 
seen by Enoch's walk. In verse number 5, the Bible says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, if you know your Bible, you know back in Genesis 5, the Bible says Enoch lived 360 years or 300 years. And then the Bible says he had Methuselah. And you know Methuselah, he was the oldest man that ever lived, 969 years. And the word Methuselah means when he dies, it shall be sent. Methuselah was a prophecy. He came wrapped up as a prophecy. And here he is as a young boy. And he has him, and then after that, the Bible says Enoch walked with God. For 65 years, the Bible says Enoch walked with God. When he had that boy, it changed his life. Something happened there to where spiritually Enoch began to fellowship and walk with God. There's a change that took place in his life, and that took place by faith. And you'll notice here in the text, it says he had a testimony In verse number 5, before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. The life of faith is to produce a testimony. It's not just good that we love God and we have faith enough to love Him and we worship Him privately, but that should bleed over into our lives where we have a life of faith, where you have a testimony. People know that you walk with God. The things you talk about, you're consumed with the Bible. Kind of like the burning bush, it's burned but not consumed. We should be consumed with God. And so Enoch, he began to walk with God. And he spent time with God. Even though the world was wicked. If you read about those uh, antediluvian days, the time before the flood, the Bible says every imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. The Bible speaks about the violence in the earth. I forget what the abortion number is now. Something like 76 million since 1970-something. When you think about the violence, people being killed, and of course now without capital punishment, pretty much if you kill somebody, we're going to spend, what is it, $28,000 a year, $30,000 a year, taxpayer money, we're going to spend $30,000 a year to feed you and let you lift weights and live out the rest of your days. So if somebody kills somebody, we give them $30,000 a year the rest of their life. Let's just say it the way it is. When the Bible said, Old Testament and New Testament, if somebody takes somebody's life, God has entrusted human government with the awful act that none of you ladies would like to carry out. And by the way, you shouldn't have to be the one to pull old Sparky, but God has enacted human government with that right to take that life. Now you don't see that with Cain and Abel. You don't see that until 1700 years after the flood. But he tells Noah as they begin to set up human government, he says when a man takes a man's life, you take that life. Under, under, the, under Noah before the, before the law, under Moses during the law, and Paul the apostle in Acts 26, he says if I've committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But now what you have is a situation where when somebody does that, we reward them. The Bible says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore it is fully set in the hearts of the men to do evil continually. So you have violence in the earth. We see it everywhere. There are people right now that think if you do something or say something, you deserve to be beat and punished and killed for saying a certain thing or thinking a certain way. Now, I don't know if a Bible-believing Christian believes that. I believe in freedom. I'm a freedom lover. If you want to believe the earth is flat, go ahead and walk off it. I don't care. If you want to believe that uh, you know, it's bad to eat bread, don't eat any bread. If you want to believe the Jehovah's Witnesses are right, believe it. I don't care. If you want to believe you can eat the, drink the little juice and eat the bread and it turns into Jesus' body and blood, believe it. I don't care. If you want to read an NIV, Nutty Idiot's Version, Read it. I don't care. If you want to go to a liberal church, that's up to you. You have the freedom to do that. I'm an American. But there are some people that believe if you think a certain way, you talk a certain way, you say certain things, you should be locked up and punished. That mindset is in this country. 
You say, well, Christians did that for years. No, you're talking about Roman Catholicism, you're talking about the Crusades, or you're talking about Muslims. You're not talking about Bible-believing Christians. Bible-believing Christians do not physically punish somebody because they don't believe what they believe. So what are you talking about? I'm talking about a testimony. Even though it's a wicked world, even though things are crazy, the world's got to find something to panic about. Panic about this and something to... Everybody's got phones everywhere. Everybody can take pictures except law enforcement. They can't take pictures of what they get to see, right? But everybody else can take pictures of how bad they're being, but we can't show how bad the civilians are being. Yeah, there's always... Oh, well, you know, social media is never biased. What you been smoking this morning? It's always bias. Well, the news is always objective. You been down to the CBD store? <laughs> it is a wicked world we live in. Enoch had a wicked world. The Bible speaks about that time when the sons of God saw the daughters of men. There were giants born. You had this thing with these fallen angels. You had this, uh, all this corruption, this perversion taking place. All these things taking place in Enoch's day and in Noah's day, yet the Bible says they walked with God. That encourages me, that helps me to know that even though things are bad and worse and worser, we can walk with God. You can have a good testimony. His desire, you see it, his desire is to please God. Let's just make it simple. You as a Christian are to wake up in the morning and please God with your life. Wherever you are in your life, whatever lot you have in your life, whatever jobs you have in your life, whatever position you find yourself in, young, old, middle-aged, working, home, wherever you are, God says, okay, I've entrusted you with this. I want you to please me with it. His desire was to please God. How do you do it? You do it by faith. Because we don't see the rewards down here. That's what's kind of discouraging. That's why sometimes it's good to come to church because you see other people are kind of interested too. I'm not the only one interested in learning the Bible. There's a few more, a few more of us nuts. Like the one guy always talking about Christians. Y'all are just a bunch of nuts. And the guy says, yeah, and when us nuts get raptured, you squirrels are going to be up a tree. <laughs> one day these nuts are going to be gone. But it's good to come out and know there's a few more nuts in the fruitcake. That's a bad analogy. I sure ain't no fruitcake. Amen. I don't want no fruity tooty fruitcake around me either. Amen and amen. Well, he had a desire to please God. And notice in verse number 6, he had a diligence to seek God. Look at verse 6. Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You say, well, I, do, I believe God's there. Yeah, but do you believe God will reward you? Are you diligently seeking him? You see, we've got to lay up treasures in heaven. We have to think about things we do down here that's going to have eternal gain instead of temporal gain. Instead, we get so wrapped up with the affairs of this life, we get so consumed with things going on here that we're just worried about today and tomorrow. We're not worried about eternity. We need to have the long vision. And seeking God is being diligent to find out what pleases God and doing it. That's really simple. Okay, God, what do you want me to do? I want to do that. And so Enoch had a life that was a testimony of faith. Now let's finally look at Noah here, verse number 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. We see the labor of faith. This is seen by Noah's work. So we have worship, we have walk. That's what Enoch did, he walked in testimony. And then we have work. We have Noah working, laboring. He prepared an ark. And God told him, you know the story of Noah. He told him to go build a boat. And Noah's like, what for? Because pre-flood times, the Bible teaches us a mist went up from the earth. There was a different type of geologic. There wasn't this type of hydrologic cycle that we have today with condensation, evaporation, and all that. And so there, was, there wasn't rain clouds and rain like we know it today. And so for about 1,600 years of human history, you didn't have that. 
And he tells Noah to build a boat because it's going to rain. And Noah's like, what's rain? <laughs> you talk about faith. And so Noah believed God by faith, so he prepared by faith. Notice in the text there, the Bible says being warned of God. Boy, people don't want to be warned, do they? Unless there's something that the world wants to warn you about. Nobody wants to be told that they're wrong. Nobody wants to be bullied. <laughs> God forbid a preacher raise his voice a little bit and say, if you keep rejecting Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell when you die. God forbid a preacher say that. That would offend people. God forbid a preacher say, you know what? Drunkenness is a sin. Adultery is a sin. Sodomy is a sin. Not a lifestyle. It's still in the Bible. God forbid a preacher say, the scripture says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. God forbid a preacher warn you, okay, if you're not saved and you step out into eternity without Jesus Christ, you are going to a Christless eternity, translated, burning fire. Jesus said, where the fire, where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. Everlasting smoke, everlasting torment, everlasting torture, everlasting flames, and you can't get out. It's not a good place. Judgment, warning. God forbid a preacher tell a Christian, you're going to face the judgment seat of Christ and you're going to give account of the things done in the body. Your works are going to be brought before the Lord. The things that you've done, you might receive a reward or your works may be burned up. There is a judgment day coming for all of us, saved or lost. We should heed the warning. We should take account of our lives. God said, Noah, there's a flood coming. There's a warning. The Bible calls Noah over in 1 Peter a preacher of righteousness. We don't have time to turn to all the text. But the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter number 6 that man's days were 120 years. I believe when you read Genesis, you get the idea that God gives Noah that commission to build the ark and gives him 120 years. Back before the flood, men lived to be a lot older. People say, oh, that's not real years. It's real years. And, of course, you had different situation with the... Uh, like I said, with the oxygen and with the earth and so forth, people lived to be a lot older. After the flood, when you read the genealogies, the ages begin to dwindle down. Abraham's like 175, and you don't get much older than that. Uh, maybe Isaac, no, no, Isaac's not old. But those ages begin to drop off, and so things change. But Noah had 120 years to build that ark. And the Bible calls him a preacher of righteousness. So as he's... Building, he's a preaching. He'd put a nail in there and he'd preach a little bit. He'd bring a board over there and he'd preach a little bit. Really, the whole thing that he's doing is a great illustration. <laughs> you talk about he had three points on a poem, but really he didn't need a poem because he had an illustration. The ark. Here's this big thing. What are you doing, Noah? Okay, there's my first point. <laughs> here's what I'm doing. God has given us a warning and he's going to drown this place out unless you get on this boat. So we have the preparation, the pre-warning of Noah. God warned him with his word. And then we have the preparing where he had a plan and of course he preached and he began to build this ark. But he did all this, verse number 7, by faith. And see, when we think about our own lives, we want to see illustrations of faith. We, we can see it right here. Noah hasn't seen the flood. He hasn't seen any hints or signs that there's going to be a flood. He simply has to take God at His word. What does the Bible say? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God has given us the Bible and we are to read and we are to let those words get into our minds. That's how God speaks to us. I know a lot of you like picture books. Right? You get a magazine, you just flip through the pictures. People don't read anymore. I know some people have eye trouble and they can't read. Well, if you can't read the Bible, you can get the little apps and listen to the thing. And you can at least listen to it. Get it in you. And what that does is 
that gives you the faith. It strengthens your faith. It verifies your faith. It's the facts that back up your faith. It's amazing that we have all of these things in Scripture, all the truth of Scripture, but we don't use it. We have all these promises from God. We have all these words from God, but we don't put it into practice. Some of y'all, may older folks, may remember the Merv Griffith show. Y'all remember that? <laughs> they have all these different, you know how they have these different people. He had this muscle bodybuilder guy on there, you know, and he's up there. He had muscles coming out places you didn't even know you had muscles. And so he's doing all this stuff, you know, showing off all his muscles. And so Merv asked him, he says, okay, uh, what do you use all those muscles for? And he said, he says, no, no excuse me, uh, uh, what, what do you use all those muscles for? And he said, the guy didn't get the point. The guy didn't use his muscles. I mean, he just used them to show them off. Why does God give you the Word of God? Why does He give you faith? So you can put it into practice. Put it into shoe leather. Let's use it. Let's prepare. Let's preach. Noah's a great builder. He's a great preacher. He preached with his words. What he said about why he was doing what he was doing. He preached with his work. Every time he showed up at the ark, he's preaching. He preached it with his witness, with his testimony. Year after year after year after year, 120 years he's doing the same thing. Still coming to church? You got a good excuse not to come now. Right? Might get sick. Might catch something. I mean, really. And I'm not saying I'm not taking that lightly. But still coming? It's a blessing that you're still coming. And we even have air conditioning. And padded pews. You didn't have to walk. And thank God the preserving of Noah and his house. Noah was rewarded. And God rewarded his faith, and of course, him and his family were saved. Your work will be rewarded. In review, as we look back over these three lives, we think about worship. But that should lead, in verse number 2, to walking with God. And that should lead to verse number 7, working for God. We don't need to possess a faith. We need a faith that possesses us. And we need to be surrendered to that. And I think sometimes the struggle that comes in with us, we know all this, but we're just hesitant to take that step of faith. We're just hesitant to believe God and to do what He told us to do. And that hesitancy cripples us. It's kind of like the procrastination. It's kind of like that... Uh, that preacher, you know, he says, we got a problem. They had a church business meeting. He's like, we got this problem of procrastination. You know, we you know, we got a leaking roof over here. And we got this going on. We keep procrastinating. And they say, well, preacher, what do you suggest we do about it? He goes, I'll tell you what, we're going to put it on the books and we're going to bring it up at the next meeting. <laughs> no, the thing is, God has already told you something you need to do in your life. He's already dealt with you about some things you need to step out on faith and do. The thing to do is to... Be obedient. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yes, we have the tangible Bible. We can read it. We have the words. We see it. But then we also have God's moving in our hearts to do things for Him and to live in a way that pleases Him. That's just as important because it's a life of faith and it's God dealing with us. There was this uh, lady and she was all scared about getting on a plane. Not because of breathing everybody's air, but she just didn't want to get up there and fly, you know. I mean, that's just a scary thing. So when she got on the plane and she sat down, she just she just kind of just did this the whole time. She was just so scared and nervous, you know. She didn't want to. <laughs> so finally when it was all said and done and she got off, she, she made it. And she told the flight attendant as she was leaving, the lady was like, well, you were all nervous. You made it. You got her safe. She goes, yeah, I didn't put my whole weight down. <sighs> See, we're, if you're saved, you are in Jesus Christ. Your weight's already down. You just need to start living like it. And I think if we can do that, go ahead and put our weight down, that we'll be able to ex experience some things and experience some assurance and some blessings by living a life. And the greatest thing 
It says in verse 6, He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. You, know, you might not see the reward down here, but to get up there and hear him and you come in front of Him and hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. It'll be worth it. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank You for the Scriptures. Thank You for this text. Thank You for these examples that we can see faith in the lives of these Old Testament characters. God, I pray that You might help us to, to put our whole weight down, to be fully surrendered. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't be hesitant in our faith, but we may yield to you 100%. Lord, help us to stand on the promises of the Word of God, even though we have a wicked society that we're dealing with, even though we have all kind of distractions. Lord, help us to seek to please you and not get our focus off of you. Enoch was walking with you, and one day you just took him on to be with you. And Father, I pray that we could be so caught up in fellowship with you that it's no surprise when you snatch us out of here. Lord, I look forward to that day. I pray, Lord, you might increase our faith like the disciples prayed. We all wax faint in our faith. God, we know what's true. We know what's right, but sometimes we doubt. Lord, forgive us for our doubts, please. Lord, help us to trust you like we should. There's no reason we shouldn't trust you. We've already trusted you with our soul and with eternity. Lord, help us to trust you with our daily lives. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey man, you're dismissed. Thank you so much for coming.